Yeah, yeah, so there I was, apprenticed to the most powerful wizard in Airedale, and, and I was on the fast track to becoming a super duper powerful, powerful wizard myself. Wait, what? why are you telling us this? Yeah, no one cares about your backstory as a sage. Indeed, no one here, except for maybe our illustrious dungeon master, wants to know what your backstory is. Well, well, isn't this the skit to introduce our backstory creation video? No, no, we're not even planning on making a backstory creation video. Yeah, you idiot, didn't you read the script? Hey, that's not very nice. Nobody even told me Hey, stop touching my dice! Whoa, 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 there, there, there's no yelling at other players. Indeed, that, that is rule number 47 in the social contract that our group collectively decided upon. Yeah, and according to the associate handbook, if a rule is not included in the social contract, it cannot be enforced at the game table. Well, well, well that's... Dumb. Why, why can't we just use common sense instead of having to write everything down? Common sense? Are you a moron? Yeah, common sense isn't really that common these days. Indeed, in today's day and age where almost everyone is offended by almost everything, the safest course of action is to ratify everything in the social contract. Yeah, I agree. I've seen lots of character sheets in my day and uh, the Barbarian is not the only one to have dumped intelligence. Okay, that's fair. So so if everyone is as dumb as I am, then I think we should definitely put no dice sharing in our social contract. I agree, and I also want to point out what a great job our Barbarian did in getting this skit back on track. Yeah, 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 you see? I'm I'm smarter than all you give me credit for. I, I might even end up multi-classing into a wizard someday. Welcome to the DM Layer. I'm Luke Hart, and I've been a Dungeon Master since high school. On this channel, I give practical Dungeon Master advice that you can use in your Dungeons & Dragons games. Today in the Layer, we're gonna be talking about the social contract in role-playing games. <laughs> I love the social contract. I will define what the social contract is, go over the things you want to consider, including in your group's social contract, explain how to make the social contract, and then discuss how to use the social contract once you make it. Jam-packed full of information today. And before we jump in, I want to remind folks that I publish 100% free Dungeon Master resources over on my website, thedmlayer.com. You can get entire D&D 5th edition adventures, magic items, new monsters, random tables, and tons of other useful crap. Which probably not call it crap, but... I also have a newsletter you can sign up for which delivers free DM resources directly to your email every single week. There are links to both the DMLayer.com and my newsletter sign up page down below very conveniently right down there. Yeah, go check it out. All right, first thing we're going to do is define what a social contract is and it shouldn't take too long. And there are essentially two different ways that social contract is generally used when you're talking about it in RPGs. The first way it's used is this unspoken social contract that generally refers to two items. One, the game master will create a game for the players to play, and two, the players will play that game and not ignore the plot hooks and adventures and wander around and screw around. If either of these are not fulfilled, one of the two parties, or both, will be dissatisfied with the game. So that's just a very general social contract idea. And the second way the social contract is used is a more elaborate written social contract that establishes boundaries, expectations, and responsibilities of the player and the dungeon master. In other words, these are things that are allowed and not allowed in the game and how the players and game master should behave and what they should do. I will be deep diving into the second type of social contract today, though I do talk about the points of the first type from time to time as well. And, and I want to mention here that it's kind of unfortunate that certain parts of a social contract are even needed. Honestly, I've never had one with any of my groups. I've just assumed that there were some things like explicit sex scenes, rape, and murdering children that basically have no place in an RPG, so I just never went there. It feels like there are some things that just should be assumed to be off limits. I don't know. It's it's almost like it's a it's a it's a comment on the moral and social condition of our society that we need to spell some things out. But here we are, 
right? Here we are. And, 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 and it's also a comment on our society when people freak out over every little perceived slight and offense. So anyway, in this day and age, you should probably have a social contract. And there are probably people down in my comments freaking out right now. However, there are some things that need to be talked about to set expectations of everybody at the game table because they're not questions of good and bad, but simply personal preferences, such as dice sharing, for instance. Some people share dice, some don't. And it's super, super important to be sure that everybody at the game table understands what the policy on dice sharing is about. Oh, I mean, here's, a, here's a pro tip for you. If you screw up, don't blame the lack of a social contract or safety measures for your screw up. If you make a bad call, own it. If you introduced something into the game that made others feel uncomfortable, own it and apologize for doing it. Not having a social contract or safety measures is not an excuse to act like a sleazeball. People should still be expected to be good moral human beings, even if that behavior isn't codified into a social contract. So just felt the need to explain that, get that off my chest there for you. Okay, things to address in a social contract. All right, I'm going to discuss some things to consider including in your group's social contract, but bear in mind that a social contract is specific to each individual group. There is no blanket social contract that everyone should follow. The first thing are boundaries. What things make you uncomfortable? What things don't you want in the game? And this is a question for everybody to answer. For instance, rape or foul language. And again, these boundaries are going to vary from group to group. Some groups might not want to have foul language. Other groups curse like sailors and everybody's fine with it. And that's just a, one small example. Some groups might want to talk about other things that might trigger certain individuals that you want to stay away from because it makes them feel uncomfortable. Number two, you want to talk about expectations. These, these are basically just things that all the players and the game masters are expected to abide by. And here are my suggestions for social contract items that all groups should consider including because they are common issues that many games deal with. For instance, you would have expectations for the dungeon master. You might say that the dungeon master prepares a game for the players to play and is ready to run the game. Dungeon Master will design a game that is intended to be fun for both the players and the Dungeon Master. And the Dungeon Master is open to adjusting their game based on player feedback. If you feel the need to codify those things in a written social contract, go ahead and do so. Those kind of are obvious no-brainers to me, but not all Dungeon Masters understand that you're supposed to design a game and make it fun for people. They just wing it, don't do anything. I don't know, you might need to write it down. A lot of these are gonna seem like Captain Obvious moments, I know, but it's not Captain Obvious for everybody. Number two, player expectations. These, now, now we're getting into some juicy stuff here, some things that are probably pretty important to consider because lots of people have stories about players that uh, don't fulfill these sorts of expectations. The first one is that the players will create characters that are willing to play in the game the DM is running. For instance, uh, you know, the whole thing about creating a PC that doesn't actually want to be an adventurer, they want to be a blacksmith or something, and then they don't want to go on one of the modules that the group decided to run and they just want to stay in town and create horseshoes and stuff like that. Plenty of, plenty of players get it in their brains to create characters like that. So you might want to establish the expectation that be willing to run the game, play in the game that we all decided we're going to play. I don't know. Another common thing is maybe the expectation would be that you will create characters that will stick together with the group. For instance, you wouldn't have lone rangers or ed edgelord characters that are all antisocial, want to wander off by themselves, forcing the dungeon master into a split party all of the time. So you might want to put a little bit of an expectation or social contract about character design and how you design your characters and stuff like that. Might want to put a little clause in there that the players will play the game the dungeon master presents and they don't rebel against it. You know, the players I'm talking about, you know, the, the dungeon master will present plot hooks, they'll present a variety of different plot hooks, and their PCs always ignore the adventures, and they ignore the plot hooks, they ignore the game the dungeon master is trying to run for them, and they always, always want to go do something else. I don't really have players that do this sort of thing to me, but from the comments that I hear, I hear them in live streams, I hear them down in the YouTube stuff, um, there are groups like this, and players that do these sorts of things, with feels like surprising regularity 
which is a little terrifying to me. Uh, so you might need to codify these things to make sure your players aren't falling into these big, huge pitfalls, which can make your life as a dungeon master very, very unenjoyable. Number three are just some expectations for everyone at the game table. This is one expectation that I have for my players and for me, is that we will help create and maintain an environment where everyone can have fun. You can't force people to have fun, but if the environment for the possibility of fun happening exists, that's what we're going for. Another expectation I have for everybody in my group, including me, is that we contribute positively to the group and to the environment. There must be an overall net increase in fun because of every person's presence. Stands to reason then if, if somebody's presence is bringing the fun down repeatedly over and over and over again, probably need to talk to that person. You listen when others speak. You don't cut each other off. You be respectful. You don't have side conversations, that sort of thing. You also want to consider miscellaneous rules for your group. For instance, electronic usage. You get the phone, the cell phones, the laptops, all these sorts of things. Are you going to allow it? Are you not going to allow it? Something for you to decide. And you might want to talk about bringing your own supplies to the game, including your own dice. You might have some strict rules about dice sharing or no dice sharing. Some people don't like their dice to get touched. You might want to codify that rule because heaven forbid that somebody touch somebody else's dice and hands get chopped off because somebody got triggered. And it's <laughs> Touching dice can be a serious business. You might want to consider putting that into your social contract. Stupid dice sharing, I swear. Number three, group rules. These are just some very generic, basic rules and guidelines for how the group is going to be run. For instance, how do you handle absences? Do you keep on playing if a player can't make it or do you reschedule the whole game? What's going to be the game schedule and the cadence every other week on Saturday at 4 p.m.? Does the game start on time and if you're late, you just miss out? Or are you gonna wait there for two hours for Jim Bob to come and Jim Bob's always late? I mean, you could do that if you want, but you might wanna talk about it. Playing somebody else's character when they're gone. Is, if, is that okay that if a player can't make a game session that another player just play his character? or should that character not be there? Talk about those things with your players. And those are just some examples of things you might discuss, but have an idea of some of these uh, agreements of conventions and how your game is gonna run with your players. Number four, anything that has caused a problem for someone in the past in a game. So basically, based upon your experience, anything that you've had difficulties with in the past, you might wanna consider codifying them into your social contract to make sure that everybody understands things. For instance, you might want to talk about arguing about the rules. Once you make a decision about something, is it okay that players just keep on arguing with you and drag the whole game down into the sewers and nobody has any fun because you're just busy arguing over rules because everybody loves arguing over rules? Or <laughs> should they have a reasonable discussion but once the dungeon master makes a decision, you move on. You might wanna talk about the dungeon master taking control of players' characters and just dictating what their characters do. Not something I recommend for dungeon masters. Consider talking about side conversations, because those can be a problem, and you'll want to talk about touching other people's dice. We know how important that is. How to create the social contract. All right, now I want to dig into the nitty gritty of how to go about creating a social contract for your group. Basically, the way I recommend doing it is during your session zero, as a group around the table, you will just decide, hey guys, we're gonna do a social contract and we're gonna talk about a lot of these things. Go around, you have a discussion. You decide what's gonna be in your social contract. See what everybody is comfortable with. Get, get everybody on the same page so that you understand what the boundaries are, what the limits are, what the group conventions are going to be and how things are gonna go down. Next, afterwards, email everyone privately asking if there was something else they would like added to the social contract. You know, just in case they didn't feel comfortable sharing with the group publicly. Number three, write up that social contract and email it to everybody, get them all that information. And uh, make sure you're very clear when you're emailing that out, whether you're, you know, touching each other's dice is allowed or not, make sure that's in there. You might wanna bold it, italicize it, and make sure everybody's very clear about that. And the fourth thing here is that you want to amend the social contract as needed during the course of the game. There's no guarantee that things are going to stay the same always. You might find some new things to throw in there. You might have some things in there you can pull out, et cetera, et cetera. Next, 
how to use the social contract. So basically, when someone doesn't follow the social contract, you or somebody else, doesn't have to be the dungeon master, it could be another player as well, calls them out on it and asks them to follow it. Now you can do this publicly during the course of the game or you can do it privately. I think it really depends on what exactly the nature of the offense is and therefore what the most appropriate way to do it would be in game publicly or privately. For instance, somebody's going into a rape scene, you might wanna just put the halt on that right away publicly and be like, whoa, stop right there. And don't be afraid to just call it out and tell them to stop. You don't have to sit there with like shocked faces and put your head down and stuff like that. You can literally just say, whoa, stop, not cool. Like you don't have to be a bystander and just let it happen. You can say something, you can speak up. But if it's something like constant side conversations, you know, eh, you're gonna do it publicly, you might, but you can also just take that privately and be like, hey dude, you know, you guys are always talking a whole lot. It's kind of disruptive to the group, so if you could not, that would be great for everybody. And finally, if someone repeatedly violates the social contract, you might consider removing them from the game if the behavior is egregious enough and they just aren't improving. For instance, if a person who repeatedly touches your dice when you've made it clear that you do not participate in dice sharing, well, that person is a sleazy, no good human being and should be kicked from your group immediately. Remember, if you're looking for dungeon master resources such as entire D&D 5th edition adventures complete with maps designed for use on virtual tabletops, head over to my Patreon by clicking the link below or the icon on the screen. I publish loads of D&D content every single month to help dungeon masters reduce their prep time and improve their games. For instance, my April PDF, which is available now, contains 10 traps, 10 new magic items, five puzzles, 10 adventure ideas, and two fifth edition adventures, The Undying Brain and The Bloodstone Strike. If you enjoyed how I exemplified unwanted dice sharing as a way oversensitive people freak out over trivial offenses, offenses, give, a, <laughs> give this video a thumbs up. And if my insensitive treatment of unwanted dice sharing triggered you, smash that thumbs down button. And until next time, stop touching my dice!